Holy Trinity. Though the word Trinity is not found in the scriptures, today's second reading includes the apostolic greeting that begins the liturgy. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In the Gospel, Jesus sends his disciples forth to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. More than a doctrine, the Trinity expresses the heart of our faith. We have experienced the God of creation, made known in Jesus Christ and with us always through the Holy Spirit. We celebrate the mystery of the Holy Trinity in word and sacrament as we profess the creed and as we are sent into the world to bear witness to our faith. The Lord be with you. As we gather to worship in various places, may we be blessed by God, who forms us in word, sacrament, and community. We acknowledge with gratitude and respect that we are on the traditional land of the neutral and Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples, who have cared for it for thousands of years. More recently, the Haldeman Proclamation of 1784 granted a tract six miles on either side of the Grand River from its source to Lake Erie, to the Six Nations Haudenosaunee of the Grand River. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Pastor Stephen Weber from St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Cambridge, Ontario, and I'm glad to have you join us for worship today. On the order of the Chief Medical Officer of Health of Ontario, we have temporarily closed our church building and have suspended all gatherings. Therefore, we are meeting virtually as a congregation. Thank you to our Minister of Music, Katrina Lowe, for recording a prelude and postlude for us again today. Your music is always a beautiful and important part of our worship at St. Paul's, and we appreciate your gift to us this day. Thank you all for the many ways you've been reaching out for one another. I'll be checking in by phone as much as I'm able with many of our members. If you need assistance, please phone the church office and leave a message, and I'll arrange for help. I check frequently for messages. In light of the focus on racism these past weeks, a new hymn has been written by Carolyn Winfrey Gillette. Andy Paulson has given us several of her hymns in the past for our gathering style worship service. The author says that this hymn prayer may be helpful for those of us seeking to be strong white allies to support people of color now and for the long term. Here's her newest hymn. It's called, There is a Time for Silence. There is a time for silence, a time to listen well, a time to hear the painful stories others have to tell. O God, may we who love to talk now hear the rage and fear, and may we learn from neighbors who have long been silenced here. There is a time for asking, a time to pause and pray, there's a time to hear the prophets speak of God's new day, to hear the words of Jesus who taught welcome, truth, and love, to hear the Spirit speaking through the ones who shout, enough. There's time for humble study, for reading, and for thought. God, may we learn from others of the justice they have sought, and may we learn from those who bravely stand against the hate so when we're called to justice, we, your church, won't hesitate. There's time for good reflection, to ponder who we've been, to think how our own attitudes have paved the way for sin, to listen to the ones we fear, to folks we may resent, to hear of Jesus' call to love and humbly to repent. And there is a time to work now, to boldly say their names, to protest and to organize, to advocate for change, to use our voices and to stand with those who are oppressed as we seek justice hand in hand, Lord. May your world be blessed. At whatever time and location you are accessing this, thank you for doing so. It is good to be together in whatever way possible in this time of physical distancing. We continue now with worship. I greet you in the name of our triune God, 
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Almighty Creator and ever-living God, we worship your glory, eternal three in one, and we praise your power, majestic one in three. Keep us steadfast in this faith, defend us in all adversity, and bring us at last into your presence, where you live in endless joy and love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The children's time. It's a mystery. I'm so very glad you're here because I know that you're bringing sunshine and joy wherever you are. So, can anyone tell me what the word mystery means? A mystery is something that's not understood or something you can't understand. Maybe you've heard the word mystery mentioned when it's used to describe a mystery book, a story in which something has to be figured out. When I was about your age, I really enjoyed a series of books called the Hardy Boys Mystery Series. And there was also a series like that about a female detective named Nancy Drew. Has anyone heard about those books? In the Hardy Boys or Nancy Drew mystery book series, there was always some crime to be figured out. Who was the criminal? And by the end of the book, the mystery was solved. By the end of the book, the Hardy Boys or Nancy Drew had figured out who did the crime. The mystery was always solved. By the end, it was no longer a mystery. So a mystery is something that is difficult, maybe impossible to figure out. In worship today, we celebrate a mystery. Does anyone know what that mystery is? Today, we celebrate the mystery of the Holy Trinity. The mystery of the Holy Trinity describes God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The mystery of the Holy Trinity proclaims that God is three in one. God is three, but God is also one. And I sure can't understand that. It's a mystery. But it's not like the mystery that the Hardy Boys or Nancy Drew solved. The Holy Trinity is a mystery that we just can't figure out. And that's because God is so awesome and so wonderful. All we know is that we have experienced God in three ways, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three ways, but God is one. I'll talk more about that in the sermon, but it's not going to be a mystery that we can solve. Now I invite you to move into your favorite prayer posture. It may be hands open, facing up to receive the gift of God's presence in prayer. It may be hands folded and eyes closed to help you concentrate. Or it may be crossing your arms across your chest to form an X, the first letter in the name Christ in Greek, and it feels like a hug from God. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for being so awesome and so wonderful. Thank you for coming to us in three ways, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Help us always to seek to understand you more fully so that we grow in faith. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Your parents, parents have children's bulletins for you that you're welcome to work on at any time, even while you're listening to the sermon. The creation of the heavens and the earth. At the beginning of time, God the Creator, God the Powerful Word, and God the Life-Giving Spirit form the earth and all its inhabitants. God sees that all this created work is good, and then God rests on the seventh day. In today's reading, when you hear the words, and God said, please respond with, it was good. A responsive reading from the beginning of Genesis. The very first words in the Bible tell us that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Then the Bible goes on to tell about God's creation. The first thing God created was light. The Bible tells us that God said, let there be light, and there was light. 
And God said, it was good. Then God said there needs to be a space to separate the waters of the heavens from the waters on the earth. So God created a space to separate the earth from the heavens. He called it sky. And God said it was good. Next, God brought all the waters of the earth together to make the oceans and the seas and to create dry land between them. Then God covered the dry land with flowers, trees, grass, and God said it was good. God paused and looked at the beautiful trees and flowers, and God said it was good. Then God continued creating. God created the sun, moon, and stars. They were beautiful. God looked at them, and God said, it was good. Then God created the birds and fish. God blessed them and told them to multiply so that the sea would be filled with fish of all shapes and sizes, and the air would be filled with beautiful birds. God looked at them, smiled, and God said, it was good. Finally, God made the animals tall, skinny giraffes and furry little squirrels. He made cuddly little kittens and big, ferocious lions, animals of every kind. Then God made man and woman. The Bible says God made people to be like God, and God put them in charge of all that God had created, the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and every living creature. And God said, it was good. When God had finished, God looked at all that God had created, and this time God said, it was very good. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Our response to the first reading is Psalm 8. We'll read it responsibly by half verses, which honors the Hebrew poetry format, which is parallel thought. The words that I say will introduce a thought. Your response then gives the same thought, but in different words or from a different perspective. Psalm 8 by half verses. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You whose glory is chanted above the heavens out of the mouths of infants and children. You have set up a fortress against your enemies to silence the foe and avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you have set in their courses. What are mere mortals that you should be mindful of them, human beings that you should care for them? Yet you have made them a little less than divine. With glory and honor you crown them. You have made them rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet. All flocks and cattle, even the wild beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Paul's farewell to the church at Corinth. Paul closes a challenging letter to the Corinthians with an appeal to Christian fellowship grounded in the triune harmony of God's grace, God's love, and the Spirit's partnership. St. Paul writes, Finally, brothers and sisters, farewell. Put things in order. Listen to my appeal. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Word of God, word of life. Living in the community of the Trinity. 
After his resurrection, Jesus summons his remaining disciples and commissions them to baptize and teach all nations in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw Jesus, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. The Sermon, Lark and the Trinity. On this festival day of the Holy Trinity, today's reflection comes from our Lutheran, Anglican, Roman Catholic Interchurch Committee, also known as LARC, L-A-R-C. LARC includes representatives from our Eastern Synod, as well as the Anglican Dioceses of Huron and Niagara, and the Roman Catholic Diocese of Hamilton. Our Lutheran representatives are Pastors Monica Wiesner, Hans Borch, and Jeff Smith. The group was started in the 1990s because our area bishops wanted our three churches, Lutheran, Anglican, and Roman Catholic, to work together. I was one of the first three co-chairs when I was a pastor in Burlington. Here's today's message from Lark, which I've rewritten a bit. As members of LARC, we seek to understand the convergences and divergences within our traditions, hoping for a time when Jesus' prayer that all may be one is answered. One of our areas of convergence is belief in the Trinity, as articulated in the Apostles and Nicene creeds. The questions arise again in our own time. What is this Trinity in which we believe? What difference does it make that God is triune. We talk about God in three persons. What is a person anyway? We sometimes hear or give at this time in the church year explanations of the Trinity. We struggle to articulate our belief because our experience of God is something that is simply beyond our various interpretations. When we try to speak of, or write about, or explain this experience, we always end up with something less than adequate. We're in much the same situation as Jesus was when he spoke about the reign of God. Jesus told us it's like a mustard seed. It's like a pearl of great price. It's like yeast in flour. It's like a net catching big fish. Each of these word pictures or parables offers a glimpse, but none explains or describes it fully. As each of these word pictures and others proved inadequate, Jesus offered another. And in the end, he showed us. The reign of God is experienced. So too the Trinity, the name our ancestors in the faith have given to the reality of God. We need to remember that the experience came first. As people struggled to describe their experience, they offered various analogies for the Trinity, many of which were declared to be heretical or false beliefs. Lutheran satire, a Facebook or YouTube page set up by the Missouri Synod, illustrates some of these in analogies in a slightly irreverent way. Here it is. Okay, Patrick, tell us a bit more about this Trinity thing. Yeah, Patrick, tell us. But remember that we're simple people without your fancy education and books and learning, and we're hearing about all of this for the first time. So try to keep it simple, okay, Patrick? Yeah, real simple, Patrick. Sure, there are uh, three persons of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, yet there is only one God. 
Don't get what you're saying here, Patrick. Not picking up what you're laying down here, Patrick. Could you use an analogy, Patrick? Sure. Uh, the Trinity is like, uh, water and how you can find water in three different forms. Liquid and ice and vapor. That's modalism, Patrick! What? Modalism, an ancient heresy confessed by teachers such as Noetus and Sibelius, which espouses that God is not three distinct persons, but that he merely reveals himself in three different forms. This heresy was clearly condemned in Canon 1 at the First Council of Constantinople in 381 AD, and those who confess it cannot rightly be considered a part of the Church Catholic. Come on, Patrick! Yeah, get it together, Patrick! Uh, okay, uh, then the Trinity is like uh, the sun in the sky, where you have the star, and the light and the heat. Oh, Patrick. Come on, Patrick. That's Arianism, Patrick. Arianism? Yes, Arianism, Patrick. A theology which states that Christ and the Holy Spirit are creations of the Father and not one in nature with him. Exactly like how heat and light are not the star itself, but are merely creations of the star. That's a bad analogy, Patrick. You're the worst, Patrick. All right, sorry. The Trinity is like... Uh, this three-leaf clover here. I'm gonna stop you right there, Patrick. Yeah, hold your horses, Patrick. You're about to confess partialism. Partialism? Yes, partialism. A heresy which asserts that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not distinct persons of the Godhead, but are different parts of God, each composing one-third of the divine. And who confesses the heresy of partialism? The first season of the cartoon program Voltron, where five robot lion cars merge together to form one giant robot samurai, Obviously. I've never heard of Voltron. Of course you haven't. It's not going to exist for another 1,500 years now, Patrick. Yeah, get with the program, Patrick. I mean, really, Patrick. I'm going to stab you in the face, Patrick. Okay, that was probably a bit much. All right, I'll try again. Uh, the Trinity is like how the same man can be a husband and a father and an employer. Modalism again. All right, then it's like the three layers of an apple. Partialism revisited. Fine. The Trinity is a mystery which cannot be comprehended by human reason, but is understood only through faith and is best confessed in the words of the Athanasian Creed, which states that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the substance, that we are compelled by the Christian truth to confess that each distinct person is God and Lord, and that the deity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is one, equal in glory, co-equal in majesty. Well, why didn't you just say that, Patrick? Yeah, quit beating around the bush, Patrick. Now let's all put on some giant green foam hats, get riotously drunk, and vomit in the Chicago River to celebrate our conversion. <laughs> So what do you guys do for a living? Well, we come from a long line of snake farmers, Patrick, but truth be told, business has been real bad lately. Oh. Yeah, about that. Most analogies about God as a trinity were all deemed to be heretical in the time before our creeds were finalized. The creeds as we have received them were formulated in response both to the experiences the early Christians had of God and to the heretical expressions of those experiences. Words of the creed came after the experience, and words are never adequate to communicate an experience of God. Yet that hasn't stopped modern thinkers from continuing the attempt. Karl Barth considered by some to be the most important theologian of the 20th century, contends that thinking of God as three persons implies that there are three personalities in God, which is the heresy of tritheism. Instead, he suggested that we profess the Trinity as one God in three modes or ways of being. Dorothy Sayers, an Anglican theologian, as well as a poet and mystery writer, focuses on Genesis 1, noting that God is creator. She contends that her experience as a creating artist, integrating idea, activity, and power, mirrors God as Father, Son, and Spirit. Richard Rohr, a Franciscan friar, 
expounds at length on the idea of perichoresis, the Greek word for rotation. He sees the God of the Holy Trinity as three persons engaged eternally in an ongoing, interweaving, choreographed dance, all moving as one precisely and fluidly to create a meaningful work together. For many of us, these various attempts do little to clarify our confusion. We still do not know what the Trinity is. But maybe that's okay. That God is beyond definition can be considered liberating. In the words of St. Augustine, we are talking about God. What wonder is it that you do not understand? If you do understand, then it is not God. So why then even bother to have Trinity Sunday at all? It's the only major Christian festival that celebrates a doctrine of the church rather than an event in sacred history. If we can't understand the doctrine, what is there to celebrate? What is there for us to take away from the celebration and live throughout the coming week? We celebrate Trinity Sunday because it helps us to be truly Christian. It helps us notice and claim what is unique about us as members of the body of Christ. It helps us focus on the ideas about God that underlie all our attempts to describe the Trinity. It helps us to ask the right questions about what it means to be Christian in the world today. If God is one, and if we are made in the image and likeness of God, how are we called to reflect this oneness? To be single-minded in the pursuit of what is true and good and beautiful? To be in solidarity with all peoples indeed with all of creation? What else? If God is three in one, and if we are made in the image and likeness of God, how are we called to reflect this diversity? To value the diversity of life which surrounds us, no matter how annoying? Think mosquito. To value the existence of all persons no matter their disabilities? What else? If God is relational, and if we are made in the image and likeness of God, how are we to be in relationship? Flexibly? Equally? Creatively? Affirmingly? Persistently? How else? If God is love, and if we are made in the image and likeness of God, how are we to love, to be love? With passion? With compassion? With selflessness? How else? None of us alone, nor all of us together, can hope to answer these questions definitively. But each of us and all of us can lean into the questions, knowing that God around us, beside us, within us, continues to call us into life. So, this Trinity Sunday, we can gather remotely to profess our faith without worrying about understanding all the words. We can proclaim the creed, not simply read it, out loud, boldly, together. If someone falters because of a word or meaning, someone else can help out. Whenever someone falls out, someone else can step in. Then, having professed our faith together, we can support each other in living that faith every day, everywhere, every way we can individually and collectively be the image of the loving, diverse, 
relational one who made us. Thanks be to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Living together in trust and hope, we profess our faith using the ancient words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers today are adapted from those prepared by Pastor Lindsay Jorgensen Skakum of Holy Spirit Lutheran Church in Edmonton, with assistance by Anita Devi Sarup, and by Pastor Rick Price of Lunenburg Lutheran Parish in Nova Scotia. Celebrating God in all, we offer our prayers for the world, the church, and all creation, saying Holy Trinity and responding, hear our prayer. Creator, Savior, Unifier, you have made us from dust. You have come to us as one of us, and you have filled us with your holy breath. We give you thanks. Holy Trinity, hear our prayer. Creator, Savior, Unifier, you call us to recognize and honor your divine image and likeness in our neighbor. Enable us to see the reality of racism and white supremacy within our lives, the world, institutions, and powers. Give us a new heart that will cause us to see through the lie that some members of God's family are inferior and others superior. Rid us of racial stereotypes that oppress some of us while providing entitlements to others. Help us to create a community that hears, embraces, and amplifies the hopes and fears of oppressed people of color while walking alongside them as we seek your justice and freedom. Heal your family, O God of diversity, and make us one with you. Holy Trinity, hear our prayer. Creator, Savior, Unifier, you create your church through good news, through physical sacraments, through promise and love. Inspire us to be a community which lives in the light of your love. Holy Trinity, hear our prayer. Creator, Savior, Unifier, no part of creation is separated from you. 
You are present to the sick and isolated, the angry and despairing, the hungry and the hopeless. Restore us to health, that we may share your love with the world, especially those whom we name before you. Holy Trinity, hear our prayer. Creator, Savior, Unifier, you hear our prayer. You inspire our prayer. You are our prayer. Open us to the vastness of your being. Holy Trinity, hear our prayer. We pray this in the name of our risen and living Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. recognizing that God's ways are often not our ways, and that with God the first are last and the last are first. Pastor Price offers this rewritten reverse Lord's Prayer that starts out at the end and so ends at the start. Let us pray. Loving God, our God, our forever God, the glory of all good things belongs to you. The power to heal creation belongs to you. The reign of love is also yours. Deliver us from all the evil that denies life and free us from the temptation to give up on the journey. As we forgive those who have wronged us, forgive us who have wronged you by wronging your good creation. Remind us that you give us everything we need for this journey. As your will is done in heaven, may it be done in us. And may your reign of love and healing be seen among us every step of the way. May your name be honored among us in heaven, loving God, our God, our forever God. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. We share that peace. Receive the blessing. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Go in peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God. Thank you.